Hi, is this Philip? Yes. Hi, it's Frida Vizel. We're going to be there in like uh, five minutes at your house, okay? Yeah. All right. Yes, I got it. I'm going to give you a call when we're there. Okay, bye. We're never here. You know, Becca, this is the first time I meet you outside of Williamsburg. You've, you've left the sect. Hi, okay, we're outside and the taxi is arriving in three minutes. All right, see ya. This is, this is Becca. Hi. We're so, I'm so glad that you're doing this. Yeah. My grandparents lived in a brownstone like this and the stairs were always so scary. Really? They're not intuitively spaced. We're gonna we're gonna go to um, 352 Broadway, right? And I, I have 151 Raw Street from your brother who's told me this years ago. That's what I thought it was 151, yeah. Yeah, so which which years? What how old were you when you lived there? I would say four to maybe nine or ten, something like that. Um, and then we moved to Wall Street, which was a uh, step up, actually. My parents, my grandparents are, are Holocaust survivors. Uh -huh. They actually didn't settle in, in Williamsburg right away. So by the time I grew up in Williams, in, in actually in Curious Joel, mm -hmm. all of my grandparents lived in Williamsburg. It kind of had become the place where the hardcore of the hardcore coalesced. Williamsburg has become such a fascinating story. Did you hear of a recent book that was published on, on the Williamsburg story? It's fic nonfiction? No, I didn't. It's a history book, but I'm sure you'll, you'll find some of it interesting. It's essentially how this neighborhood has such a, such a prime piece of real estate has come into the hands of such an unusual community. Most, most neighborhoods in such desirable locations are gentrified and mm. minority populations or, or ethnic groups are essentially pushed out yes, right. and the Hasidim are somehow holding on to that so who, who takes these tours um, who do you think I don't know I remember when at one point I was, I was teaching in a summer program in Vilnius in Lithuania um, and then these tours of Jewish Vilnius, which essentially there were no Jews left, there was just a tour. <laughs> it's a little bit like that in Prague as well, you know, like a, kind of like a. Besides. Uh, the, 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 the government likes the idea of bringing money into through tourism to celebrate the, you know, people's sentimental ideas about the Jewish past, but there's not too much going on at the moment. What I find in the city community is something real. Um, but a lot of tourism is, is just supposed to touch that sentimental yeah. hunger and satisfy it. And a quick study, you know. Yeah. You don't want to um, denigrate your source. Exactly. Of that's, what, that's what I was thinking. I shouldn't knock what, what you know, yeah. the people, hand that feeds people me. People ask me, do I believe in writing programs? I'm not going to say, <laughs> no. I'm going to say, well, you know, they pay for my mortgage. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, the, the truth is, I think there's so much room for tour guides to be sort of um, street anthrop anthropologists, right. that's my thinking, but what happens is you need the quick buck, you need the fast story, you need the extroverts who tell the same story every day without running out of steam, mm -hmm. and that sort of doesn't leave room, you, you know, I feel like it's, it doesn't leave a lot of room for people who want to do it on a slow pace and exploring. For me, being a tour guide is really about keeping my finger on the pulse of, of a neighborhood, watching it, being there again and again and again. And Absolutely. What but, about the, the, um, the, the literature of Waynesburg, like Daniel Fuchs's novels, you know? I mean, it's, it, it has that kind of um, uh, real, you know, uh, naturalism style, of, you know, kind of like post Theodore Dreiser, you know? Um, I mean, it's worth, it's worth reading just to get the flavor of, of the tenements, you know. Yeah. Tenement life. When, when you read something like A Tree Grows in Brooklyn... Yeah, which I also was thinking about, yeah. Did you relate to it? Yeah, I did. Um, yeah, this sense of, you know, tenderness and desperation. Yeah. And these families without any money. Yeah, I could, I could relate. Going to the grocery store and saying, put it on the bill, you know. Yeah. You know, you see, still see that. Mm -hmm. in Williamsburg, but probably not for poverty reasons. Mm -hmm. 
I had a, a Polish woman on a tour once mm -hmm. who got really, really emotional when we talked about it, and she said, yeah, the Polish get all the flack for being anti-Semitic because we're not fakers who haven't put up the whole PR campaign. Yeah, right. She saw Germans' incredible um, interest and effort in, in, in remedying the past as, as something that was masking, mm -hmm. sort of causing a, almost a masking, and then, and then it transferred a kind of anger to countries that didn't do likewise. Well, but some of that is some of that is legitimate like um you know in places like the ukraine and and um and lithuania the 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 local population was so cooperative with the nazis in killing the jews that the nazis almost didn't have to supply them with bullets you know yeah so, you know so that i think there's been like a a tilting away from the notion of you know everybody dying in the concentration camps to to this new to the Nazis. of bloodlands, you know, to the idea of uh, all the people who are just, who weren't even sent to concentration camps, they were just shot in the back of the head, you know. Uh-huh. My, uh, my mother really surprised me recently when she told me that they're building a synagogue in one of these, I don't remember where it was, Hungary or, or in Poland or Ukraine, and she said, in that blood-soaked land, Mm. It's like for Schultz in the land is the way she described right, yeah, it. Yeah, the blood soaked. Yeah, it's true. She couldn't believe that that it would be for for her. It's not about Germany per se, and I think that's for a lot of mm. a lot of survivors. Yeah. So I mean, did you did your mother accept the fact that you left the Satmas? It's been a long process. You know, I've been out of the community for for ten years, right. more than ten, and it's been a long process, and I am still not. I'm still not honest enough with her. Mm -hmm. I'm dying to tell her that my dog is injured because medical things is something that you talk to your mother about, you yeah. know. Right. And I really want to tell her that my dog needs surgery, mm -hmm. and I can't even make her make myself tell her that I have a dog. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like, and this is ten, ten years on, but it's been it's been a, a process of slowly. Getting comfortable. Why would it be a risk to tell her that you have a dog? I, I have a hard time bringing my yeah. strange life right. to her. I don't know, maybe it's a fear of rejection. I almost, during the pandemic, was the first time she acknowledged that I'm a tour guide by asking me how I have work. Yeah. And I said I didn't. But even since then, we don't talk about it. And I'm almost like, I don't have enough courage that she almost has to have the courage to ask me how school is for my son, because the idea of telling her that my son has school, this is something that's already become comfortable, but a boy obviously goes to yeshiva, goes to hide it. Yeah. It took me a long time to be comfortable to talk about school right. and female teachers in school mm -hmm. to her. So I had a friend who was living in one of those new high rises on the water, you know. Oh yeah, in Williamsburg? Yeah. So all of that was, you know, not the winds where I grew up. Yeah, it's shocking. Do you remember the waterfront? Oh yeah, I mean because we went to the park on Mossy Avenue. The park where they had the buses, you know. Well, oh, oh, where you got onto the bus? Yeah, you know when they had the, the bus. The bus. It sounds like a semi-bus terminal. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it was it dirty the water? Well, I didn't go swimming in it. And so, <laughs> George Carlin swam in the in the Hudson, according to his comedy. Yeah, I mean, you see these, you see these movies from the past, and you know, the, the kids are jumping in all the time into the water. Yeah. Did that happen? Yeah. In Williamsburg? Well, I think so. I mean, it certainly happened in, in Manhattan. You know. So, what years did you live in Williamsburg? I lived in Williamsburg till I was about. 11 or 12, I think. Yeah, but what years were those? Oh, uh, well, I was born in 1943. So I would say by 1947, we were in Williamsburg. Where were you before? Um, Queens. Queens? Yeah. My, my parents were in a um, candy store. Uh, there have been a, quite a few people who are substantially Wikipedia'd right. who lived in Williamsburg. Oh, sure. And... Uh, Obviously, so it was usually generative of, of um, ambitious 
Yeah. Jewish kids, yeah. Yeah, ambitious Jewish kids. I, I've heard from people who moved to Williamsburg from, from the Lower East Side who described it as a substantial... Um, so many, one woman described that she saw so many trees, she thought she, was, she thought she was in the country. Oh my God. She didn't live right under the trains though. Oh my God, well now we're gonna be at 352. Right? Yeah, here we are. This, this strip, Broadway, doesn't change much. No, how could it? But you know, all right, so there was a delicatessen over there. Kosher? Yeah, kosher delicatessen. What did they sell? You know, they sold like, what they, these, Hot dogs are called specials, you know, um, pastrami sandwiches and stuff like that. Um, and and uh, that's when my mother ran up a bill because uh, we were short of money at it by the end of the week. And that's sometimes where... she would send me in, you know, to get the food because, you know, the idea was that a little boy would, you know. Um, they would be more yeah, generous. They more wouldn't turn generous, you down. More generous, exactly. Yeah. So basically, uh, this street doesn't change because the, the elevated train uh, yeah. is such a um, dominant factor of it. And this is the way I grew up with them, with the spot, spots of sunlight, you know. Oh, what do you mean? Like, you know, you never, it was never, it was never daytime. It was never daytime. It was always these little spots of sunlight. You know, something about this particular section of Broadway is that it constantly has new shops, yeah. but otherwise nothing really changes, except the Hasidim are making matzahs here. It's oh, like, yeah. I saw there was a matzah bakery. Yeah, over there. Yeah. Okay, so this was, this was the building that I was in. Yeah, 352. So down here was a sweatshop where there'd be like a little old ladies on sewing machines, you know? Uh, probably making a pittance, you know. Um, and on the second floor, uh, there was a, a Hispanic family, very nice, uh, and we lived on the top floor. So uh, you're, you've faced straight floor. into the... Faced straight in, exactly. And the subways, you know, people would, not, I mean, the, the elevated, people would be looking into uh, my bedroom where I was sleeping and I would look at them, you know. The building was owned by a woman named Mrs. Einstein, who we hated, absolutely hated, it. And, and, and in that way that, you know, children think of old women as crones and witches, you know. Um, and she was also, she was mean, you know. And also probably we were late in the rent sometimes. Um, now the reason why we were living there was because um, after the war, um, World War II, uh, it was, it was all, we, we had, my parents had four kids, so it was six. My parents, uh, they couldn't find uh, many places that would take kids, and this was a place that would take kids. They didn't, you know, they didn't care um, as long as we paid the rent, you know. So, and, and my parents had, had uh, sold the candy store that was finished, you know. That was in Queens, the candy yeah, store? Yeah, in Queens, Jamaica, Queens. So, um, so which year was this? We're still establishing years. 45? Well, 40, 46 or something like that, yeah. So my, my parents both uh, worked in factories after that. And my, my mother worked in a place called, uh, well, first she worked in Lewitz, uh, which was a vacuum cleaner factory, and then a radio receptor. And there were a lot of factories at that time in Williamsburg. Um, was it on the waterfront or the other side? Yeah, down down there. Down by the water. Yeah, and, and my, my father was working in a, a ribbon dyeing factory that his brother owned. Um, so they basically became um, uh, blue collar workers, you know. Um, and they had this big family with, with three or four kids. It started out three kids. Yeah, and right, and there was four. Family. Yeah, so, um, so we were plunged into the ghetto. What can I tell you? Um, and at that point, you know, um, it really was a mixed neighborhood, um, and the Hasidim were not that many, you know. So one time, one time my sister Betty and I uh, were taking a nostalgic trip back here, and we, we came to 352, and, and these Hasidic kids, like the one that just left, were uh, standing in the doorway and looking at, it, at us with great hostility. Um, 
And my sister said, what are you looking at? We, used to, we were here long before you were, you know? Um, you have to understand um, that there was no love lost between uh, the Satmas and secular Jews like my family. So even though my family sent, sent us to Hebrew school, you know, we were not, obviously we're not Hasidim. Um, there was a lot of hostility. Um, one time my mother, uh, it, was, it was Saturday, it was Shabbos, and my mother was uh, buying food at a kind of key food uh, supermarket. And, and, and these Hasidic kids were, um, were jeering at her because they, they somehow knew that she was Jewish, you know. Um, and she said, you, I work all week, you know, you want to do, do the shopping for me, you do the shopping for me. Otherwise, this is one of the only time I have to shop. So, so they would openly be, they would know you're Jewish and they would feel open, op entitled? Openly hostile. That's hostile, yeah. Did you, did you, did you interact with it? You know, I, I was curious. I was not hostile, um, but I would watch, for instance, uh, the, 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 the kids would pay us playing punch ball and running around the bases and everything. And it all seemed very exotic to me, you know? What was some, you know? Uh, you didn't play these games? No, I did, but I did, but you know, sort of like, oh, they play punch ball too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and of course, the, 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 I thought of the Hasidic boys as kind of um, very pale, like you know, they never got into the sun. They seem, you know, in a way, sickly. You know what I mean? Compared to the way we lived, you know. You were hardy kids who were outside all the time. Yeah, we were outside. I, we played in the, the street. Like, Here? Yeah. We you played, played outside on, on Broadway? Yeah, exactly. And, and sometimes if my mother was home, she'd look out the window just to check that we were okay. But, you know, kids were allowed to play by themselves unsupervised much more when I was growing up. Yeah. In fact, my mother would uh, allow us to, uh, to take the, the, the train, you know, when we were like 10 years old, you know, which would never happen now. There was a different time. I, I didn't have particular hostility towards the Satmas or anything. I just uh, I just found them exotic, you know. Um, I have spoken to someone who grew up in Williamsburg at the same time as you, who was Orthodox, so it was very different. And and they felt obligated to bring the Satmars out. To bring them uh, out. Yeah. See, we went. See, we had we had synagogues, you know, um, which were basically. I only went to Orthodox synagogues. You have to understand that in this neighborhood, I didn't even I didn't even know there was such a thing as a conservative or reformed Jew. I didn't know that till I got to college. So you were either an atheist or Orthodox, and in our, in our case, in our family, we were atheist Orthodox. You know. Yeah. That's only in Williamsburg. That's the kind of culture that you had in Williamsburg. So over there was a movie theater. Where? On the corner. There? Yeah. There were lots of movie theaters. Um, the Marcy, the Commodore. The uh, Commodore was where? I think it was like uh, over down there. Broadway, yeah. Did you cross the tracks a lot? Oh, yeah, all the time. Oh, yeah? Yeah. What, did, you, did you have a palpable divide between the north and south? Well, I call that beyond the tracks, the north side. Really? Yeah. Well, you know, my my mother would would uh, shop in these uh, public markets down there, you know. So we didn't see it as such a big deal. I Different, see, you know? I see. Um, I remember um, there was a, a big snowstorm. I think in 1947, and she packed us all onto this sled and took us. It was a great adventure, you know, to sled down there and all the way across on that side, you know. This on this block there was. Um, Another movie theater, and there was a, a place called Stevens Bakery. Mm. Um, Stevens Bakery had a lot of uh, whipped cream things in it. That's why I would buy these uh, Charlotte Roosters, you know, these little cakes with whipped cream on top. Oh, with whipped cream on top? Where was that? Right, right over there. There were dairy restaurants on this side of the street, a big one called the Sunset uh, Dairy Restaurant. It was kosher and um, you know, you'd go there for blintzes or something like that. But my parents liked to go to these restaurants. You know, they were very, they were very kid-friendly restaurants. Like the dairy restaurant? You know, they'd have like a, a baby seat or something like that. They didn't, they didn't look down on you if you brought in a bunch of kids, you know. Because they were Jewish? 
they were, because they were family oriented. Yeah. B because the the kosher restaurants were more family oriented than yeah. otherwise. Yeah. These were not, um, you know, bistros. Yeah. There was. I'm pretty sure there was a synagogue over here. There was a synagogue. You know, there were tons of synagogues, and um, I remember once when when a famous rabbi came to to give a, a sermon or something. You know, this was before they had torn up the whole neighborhood and built the highway. You know, and, and we saw that happen. You know, um, and these I don't think these projects were. We're here at the time when we first moved in. No, these were like 1950s. So we went to a school around here in my, and, and to Eastern District High School, which um, eventually relocated and became a, so the building was taken over by the South Session. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Of course, of course. The Eastern District High School is, we're gonna, you wanna walk over there? Yeah. We'll check it out. You went to high school there? Didn't you leave the neighborhood? How old are you when you enter high even school? Though we left, even though I left the neighborhood, um, I went to, uh, I, would take the, I would take the bus in to Eastern District. Um, oh, really? Yeah, and I graduated and I was one of the only kids who ever gotten to an Ivy League school from there, you know. Where did you go from? Columbia? Yeah, Columbia. Yeah. Ah. That's the public library, okay. They dug under the public library for the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, pretty much, right? Yeah. So I, I spent a lot of time in there. In that, in that building. My history teacher uh, saw me with a bunch of books, you know, and, um, you know, I was like 14 or something, and I was reading Sartre and Camus and Garcia Lorca, and, and uh, he said, what you got there? And I said, well, I didn't want him to know. You know, I was intellectually precocious, which is a kind of stigma. You're not supposed to be. Oh, really? Why? You were supposed to... You know, like... Then you would be known as an egghead or something like that. So he said, oh, dirty books. I said, yeah, you know, I would rather they thought that they were dirty books than that they were adult books, you know? Anyway, so that, that was Eastern District right behind it, yeah. Yeah, let's go, let's go to the Eastern District building. Oh my God. I became a kind of big uh, macha in, in Eastern District and was elected to the Chief Justice of the Student Court. So um, at one point, um, we can cross over. Um, at one point, some reporter for the Times had written a piece about Eastern District, saying it was a um, basically um, a very l a lousy school, um, really underperforming, and that kind of thing. And um, you know, at that point, it was very much a, a minority school. Minority uh, as in a lot of Jews, or minority as in minority also like Puerto Rican. Puerto Rican, we'll say. Um, Puerto Rican, black, and, and Jewish. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, so the school got together a few kids, me and a Chinese kid and a black kid, to to to, to meet with the reporter and say, that's not true, you know, we 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 excel and blah blah blah, you know. Um, and so we were the we were the the face of the proud PR face of the school, and then. Um, and then about two years later, the school was saying, we're in big trouble, get us out of here. You know, they admitted that they were in big trouble. The school was in the the school, school, yeah. decline. Yeah. In the 1950s, that was? Yeah, like- It I was already in decline? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I graduated Eastern District about 1959 and went to college in 1960. Um, so, it, you know, it, it, it basically was, um, nobody really mixed. Um, and, and they had a thing called like uh, rapid advanced classes and basically the academically strongest kids were channeled into these and it completely we were completely cordoned off in a sense we'd yeah. only meet the other kids in lunchtime or afterwards you know and, and generally they, 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 they'd give us a hard time which I can't blame them for yeah yeah I, I, and these honors programs, yeah, it was an honor they still, program. yeah, they still do that. Yeah, I mean, I remember playing basketball and in phys ed, and you know, and this, and I was guarding this black kid, and he said, if you, if you guard me that closely, I'm going to cut you after school. It's and I said, please take your <laughs> shot. You know? <laughs> so, and I remember getting punched out by, by a girl. I thought, wow, she is, she, had, she packs a wallop, you know. So. 
Uh, was it because you were in the auto? You were like the, 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 some, the bed. Some of the kids thought because I was a an officer. I ended up being, you know, because I was an officer in the school that that I was protected kind of, but I wasn't. You know. Oh. oh, that you were treated as special. Some yeah. you did. Anyway, didn't... this was these two buildings were here, uh, the library and the and the and the high school. And you went from one to the other, you know. From high school to library. Yeah, typical. If you, if you were interested in studying, you know. In both. My parents were both worker, workers, so there was nothing to come home to in a sense. A lot of times, I just wanted to to hang out in the library. Yeah. This was all rubble, you know, when they were building the. The highway, you know. In the 50s, this was all cleared. It was sort of like um, when you see films about Berlin after the war. We, we thought we thought we were in a very similar cityscape, which was basically lots of bricks and the rubble. And know? rubble. Did you have like rats and mice come out of the because they were digging up? Well, we had rats in our house. So. Anyway, in the first place. So how would you know? Yeah. And so you but, were right over there. Yeah, right over there, exactly. What do you I, say to that? What do I say? Skyscraper that's now... Time changes everything, you know. Yeah, that's I mean, true. The, the Williamsburg that I was familiar with was, was filled with tenements. And when you walked into uh, the tenement to visit a friend or something like that, um, there was a kind of fried onion smell, you know. Uh, Delicious. Yeah, but I mean, you know, everything was... Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, there, there was the smells of the ghetto, you know. Um, and and um, well, that's. I I remember when I graduated, I I was just my senior year. I was going out with this with this young woman who was a runner-up Miss Venus, and her main ambition was to move out of Williamsburg. She just wanted out, you know. And I have to say that um, that when I left Williamsburg, um, I did not hold on to many, almost any friendship. I went to Columbia, um, and I never saw the people who I grew up with, you know, in high school. And, you know, which I regret now, but there it was. Yeah. But they also left Williamsburg, no? Everyone a lot, left. A lot of them left, yeah. Do you know people who stayed? Do you know anyone who's still here? No, I don't. I mean, I guess everyone eventually. They all, they all left, pretty much. Do you remember what floor you were on on Ross Street? Well, it was, um, I know it wasn't. It wasn't this. I'm pretty sure it's the top floor again. But that's where you got kicked out for that's living got, in, a, in, in a mess. That's where we got kicked out because my mother was not much of a housekeeper. Well, and also she was working all the time. She didn't have time. She would come home and she, she was trying to lose weight. And in those days they would prescribe amphetamines. Oh, God. So she would come home from work and crash, you know, come down from the amphetamine. Yeah. And, and, and she'd say, uh, you kids, you didn't clean anything up, you know, and we and didn't, you know, we weren't any, we weren't such a wonderful, you know, we weren't gonna come home from school and start cleaning, you know. And she would scream at us and we would laugh and, uh, and everything would end up more of a mess, you know. So it was not a very quiet family life. Yeah, I, I gathered that from reading. Right, Willie and that kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so. She knew how to open her mouth and. Yeah. If you read the other book about A Mother's Tale, you know, there's a lot of it in there, you know. About? About Williamsburg and about um, some good stuff, in fact, like, you know, that she, she sent us to this place called the First Chibu Day Nursery. Um, and and she got all involved with, with the women uh, who were uh, protesting to get a, a, a traffic light because a kid had been killed on the corner. Oh, really? Um, and my mother ended up being kind of a, an organizer, you know. Oh, really? And, you know, demanding picket lines and demanding, you know. And, and one of the best things about that was that the, the working class women supported each other. If you had to go somewhere, they would look after your kid, you know. There's a lot of that uh, camaraderie. A lot of that camaraderie. I think... Which, which I grew up with, yeah. That, that's not around except in places like here anymore, right? It's very, middle class people are not like that. They're, yeah. In fact, her own sister, you know, at one point my mother had to go to a doctor or something like that. And she said, could you look after the kids? And, and her sister, who was middle class, who lived in Queens, said, 
you know, no, I have better things to do, you know. So my mother was much closer to the, to the women in, the, in this neighborhood than she was to her, to own, her own sister. Yeah, exactly. Where's your family from originally? Um, my mother's side of the family was from Riga, Latvia, you know. When uh, did they come? What? When did they come? Um, she was born, since she was born in 1918, they probably came in the turn of the century, like 1900. And my father's family uh, came probably early 1900s as well. Uh, and they were from Russia. So my, mother's, my mother always acted like her family was with German Jews and, you know, so it was a mixed marriage, German Jews versus Russian Jews, you know. There's, there's something nice about this, this part of the neighborhood, you know, uh, which hasn't completely changed. Uh, which is what? I mean, you know, it's not all high price condos. Or yeah, that's the casino we keep. This is a very interesting thing that they, while they don't preserve the, the beauty of the architecture, they also keep a lot of buildings from being just... Right thrown down and built into something so much taller and see the courtyard yes that's the chuppah over there oh this is beautiful this this uh this age structure yeah it's beautiful yeah it's beautiful. Oh. oh my god but the tinted windows are something else that's been added as for the what? girls Do you remember playing in the did you play in the you were teenagers yeah i mean you know, I played a lot in, in, in elementary school and middle school. By the time I got to high school, um, first of all, it wasn't much of that. You know, no. So, no. You know, but basically was uh, was a book reader. You know, that was my sport. I played bowling maybe. Oh yeah. Yeah. There were they, bowling I mean, a small bowling alleys. Yeah, you know, there was a small bowling alley on Broadway, you know. Was it everyone had to have a sweetheart? Was that expected? I don't know, but it certainly was on our minds a lot. Oh, yeah. And there were dances. The dances, you know, like, the Jewish kids would watch the black kids dance. They were so much better than us. Um, oh, yeah? you. Were... I did, but I didn't, I didn't think of myself as particularly um, desirable. And then, um, years later, there was a reunion uh, and this, I was living in Texas, um, so I sent my mother to the... Texas? Yeah, I was in Houston. So I sent my mother to the reunion, you know, and she had a sign, and I had full bob and tongue. And she said these women came up to her and said, oh, we thought he was so cute, but huh. we didn't, you know. I said, why didn't they, why didn't they yeah. say anything in those days, you know? Why didn't they tell me? Yeah, let's go to the Avenue. The Avenue was like a magnet. You always wanted to end up on the avenue. What was happening on the avenue? Oh. Good smells, good things to eat. Pickle jaws. How many years older is your brother Leonard? Three years old. So he was just one year in high school. Yeah, I don't even know if we even duplicated. Um, yeah, when I got to high school, some of the teachers said, we're watching you, Lord Bates. We know about, you know, remember <laughs> your brother, your brother yeah. yeah. And I was like, no, I'm a good boy. Uh, you had to fix all that after him, all the reputational. Yeah. Do you remember Christmas decorations in this area? I certainly do not. No? I don't remember any Christmas decorations. In general? Not in, not in the streets, no. Not in the streets. I mean, uh, people don't understand that. You know, when I tried to explain to my my wife and daughter that, you know, Christmas meant nothing to us. Yes. No? We did Hanukkah, you know. But the neighborhood here didn't do... It wasn't a big deal. Christmas was not a big deal. It's interesting because uh, I've read people who grew up in the 30s in Williamsburg and it was expected of all the Jewish residents to sort of participate in Christmas, pretend. Yeah, well, by the time my family came along, that was not the case. You did Hanukkah, you did Pesach. Yeah. We did the high holidays. What was your, your your attitude towards the Holocaust? Like, what was the overall... My, we knew people who came back from the camps with numbers on their arms and everything. Oh, yeah. And, and my mother talked to them. Um, this neighborhood was... Um, it didn't seem that, that far from the Holocaust. I mean, you know, a lot of people would settle here. And so... Uh, 
but then some of them were so um, permanently angry, you could say. Yeah. And uh, and my mother would say, I didn't, I didn't do anything to you. You know why are you bark, bark, barking my head off? You know. Like um, like Holocaust survivors that would. That yeah, that was that was very uh, bitter, you know. And would, if there were shopkeepers, you know, they were willing to, you know, if you if you said anything, they wanted to kick you out of that shop. Oh yeah. So, but the, but I would say that the whole we certainly were very aware of the Holocaust. Of course, we didn't call it the Holocaust. But you know, the war. Yeah, the war, the camps, and so on. Um, and also, it was very. So there was a lot of that, and there was a lot of, of socialism floating around there. Um, so. How was there socialism floating around? What do you? You know, everybody knew. Everybody knew someone who was a communist. Oh yeah. Um, there's a kind of six degrees of separation, but it was more like three degrees of separation. But not like Soviet, Soviet Union kind of communist, was it? Well, I mean, sympathies there, with sympathy. There was plenty of sympathy for the Soviet Union, you know. I see. Um, I mean, my parents were basically liberal Democrats, um, and and uh, so. But we watched, for instance, um, when we got a TV, we watched the McCarthy hearings, and we were very much attuned to the Rosenberg trial and everything because we felt much more endangered by the Rosenberg trial. You know. I see. Because everybody knew somebody who was a communist. So my parents weren't communists, but we all knew people who were communists. And there was a lot of sympathy to, to ideas of... Um... Soviet Russia, which, is, which you know, is a, certainly seems uh, misguided now. But, you know, in those days it seemed like you know, a solution, a potential solution. And certainly for working class people. So... And this is post-war. Post-war, yeah. And was a part of it that, that Russia had been part of, of bringing the end of the war? There was that kind of... Yeah, that Russia basically, you know, without Russia, the war would have gone on and on, which was yeah. true. I mean, in America, it's sort of um, not part of a race, you know, like when people tell a story about the war, they don't necessarily... Uh, Talk about the Russian... The, yeah, about Stalingrad and all that. You know. but, but that was really the defeat of the Nazis. Anyway, I am not very sympathetic to Soviet Russia, so. so. But but in those days, you know, it, it was just in the air, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm more interested in. It's interesting because my parents, my mother came to America because um, in Czech, the way she tells in Czechoslovakia, you couldn't be a uh, premiyit. That's how she says it. You couldn't you couldn't be observant. Really. So they came to New York and they wound up in Williamsburg yeah. looking for religious freedom. So. Right. I see. So that wasn't in the air, like that sympathy to religious freedom? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, um, when you say in the air, you know, I mean, the, 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 it seemed like the Satans or the Hasidim could take care of themselves. They didn't need our sympathy. They were doing what they were going to do, you know? And we understood it, and it was, we accepted it, you know, there was nothing wrong with it. They didn't, you didn't feel like they were pitied, you know, they've been through so much, we have to... There was some of that, certainly. There was some of that, but there wasn't a kind of education effort. I mean, neighbors would talk to each other and you'd find out these stories, you know? So, it wasn't, a, it wasn't so much a kind of specific education, actually, it was effort. It was really in the air, you know. Um, my parents knew people had been in concentration camps, sure. We were happy to to accept them and we understood that they'd been through a lot and now they have to start to, to live their lives. And some of them were more resilient than others, you know. What do you remember from here? This is all a lot of old buildings. Yeah. That haven't been... The Avenue. The food was very good but very fattening. Very good. It still is. It was so... It was so integrated into the fabric of the neighborhood that it, there really wasn't a question of do you sympathize? It was like, did, well, well, what? It was what we saw all the time, you know? Uh, you know, we, I mean, my father's attitude was, you know, 
it's too late for me to go to synagogue. You go. You know? Oh, really? You know, send the kids. You too know? late as in in the day or too late in life? Too late in life. Too late, you know. Um, you know, I, I never had a really deep conversation with my parents about whether they believed in God or not. You know? uh, and the height of my religion, I think, was when I was about 10 or 11 years old. You know? Oh, really? Yeah. You, you were serious about it? And then after I got my bar mitzvah, I, I did try waking up early in the morning and late to fill it. That didn't last that long. You tried to do it every day? Yeah. Did your brother do it daily? No, I would say I'm the only one in the family who do it. You were the good kid. He retained some feelings. Oh, like, really? Like I still go, go to the synagogue and how hard it's about. But it, it had a lot to do with uh, uh, hearing the music and uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't think you have to believe in God to feel attached to the community. I think for me personally, faith is in, in a kind of a, a deity and has never resonated. I would say all of my intense feelings that come out of this world are not related to it. To theology. Yeah, no, they're cultural. Yeah. Do you want Rugala? Get someone at home for whom I can give you some rubber to take home. Oh, sure. Let's go. Let me get you some rubber. Okay. I won't say no to rubber. Yeah, there you go. This, this I believe, is cinnamon and vanilla. That sounds great, yeah. Let me have a few pieces of that one. Is your, is your wife Jewish? Yeah. yeah? Was that something you were thinking about? I'm sorry, I'm asking a personal question. It didn't hurt. I mean, yeah. yeah, it didn't hurt. You weren't against it. I'm not against it at all. My daughter was going to Hebrew school, and all these kids had been in Hebrew school since they were six years old. You know? And and it just said, I hate Hebrew school. And I said, yes, everybody hates Hebrew school. That's the point. It's, it's the suffering that makes it... Yeah. Suffering. This, this was a movie theater. Yeah, I'm sure I went to it too. You uh, were, but the one on Broadway is where you were. Yeah, first. the one on Broadway, yeah. yeah. The Commodore, that Commodore. was the most popular? Yeah, oh, the I... Commodore was very popular. They even, um, they gave out dishes and they did all these promos, you know. Yeah. Everybody went to the movies at, at that point, you know. See, it's a very active street, I mean, it's where the life is. Yeah, yeah. That's, That's how it was then. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It definitely is, it, because it's where all the shops are. It remains, except on Shabbos. On Shabbos, it's like dead here. Right. You know, I have such mixed feelings about these neighborhoods. Like, when I was in, in Jerusalem, I went to Mer Shayim, and one half of me was thinking, oh, I'm home, I'm back again. The other half was thinking, this is nuts. Look at all the things you're not allowed to do. There was a big poster saying, you know. Don't wear this. Mostly for women, you know. 99 prescriptions. What to wear and how to dress. And, I mean, one of the things that I have very conflicting feelings is how materialistic it's gotten, you know, how... how and what way materialistic? Everyone is shopping, it's like... Everything is back to keeping up with the Joneses. Like, it's, it's how... It's almost like the religion has become so successful that it's no longer it's becoming hollowed out from the inside. But you know, I felt in a strange way that 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 was true also with the obsession about the Holocaust, that the Holocaust was eating up Judaism and leaving nothing of the old religion. Of the old, you know, Interesting. Holocaust, Holocaust, Holocaust. I like it. I like it. Yeah, I like the uh, well, I like the feeling of community. You know, I think that one of the glories of, of New York City is is a city of neighborhoods. Yeah. And this is a neighborhood. This is a, you know, this kind of neighborhood, so un unique, is, is in many ways vanishing, you know? Yeah, well, let's, let's celebrate it while it still exists. Yeah, exactly. We're here today, and it's a beautiful day. So what memories come to mind when you walk here? Uh, well, going shopping with my mother, uh, going to uh, the appetizer store, well, they killed chickens in front of us, you know. Oh, really? Yeah. You know, chickens don't come. It's a rat wrap, you know. They actually have to be killed. <laughs> we'll have one knish warmed up. Okay. 
They have all the fattening food we were talking about they earlier. Have the stuff, yeah. No, we don't have any other stuff because we uh, make the ready for Passover. Oh. Usually it's, but it's full again. Because now we, uh, sure. we, we, that's the last day we open now. Tomorrow is the very end of the holiday. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. That's why we don't have a good selection. Here you go, miss. Thank you. Good day. Thank you. How many is over there for so, did you, did you play with a small team? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Punch ball, Punch scoop ball. ball. Yeah. Did you play uh, bouncing games like um, A, line, line, A, No, I don't think we played that, but it was for girls. Oh, yeah, I thought so. Was there a sense of class among the kids? Which family had money with them? Especially in the... Um, Especially in high school, you know. Was the majority poor? Yeah. I would say striving poor. Striving poor. Everyone wanted to get out, get up and out. Education was a ticket. So, what did did? anyone make it without education was it possible to yeah what were the the paths of success without education oh well, using the family business you know like if the family had a store you would need to come to the store you worked in the store you have to understand that uh, from from probably the the fourth grade on um, I was segregated in these honor classes. Yeah. So. Were the honor kids generally from wealthier families? No. No. no but they, they were not going to become stevedores, you know. What's a stevedore? It's somebody who works on the docks. Oh. To me, this the, this neighborhood is very uh, superficial in many ways. Very superficial and religious. Really. Yeah. Do you, is it more religious for the little bit of them? In some ways to me, yes. Only in some ways. In the in the in the inner kind of searching spirituality. Uh-huh. One thing that I that that was great was on Sith Tor, the streets would be taken over by, by the Lubavitcher? Everybody would be dancing. I didn't have friends in the Basita community. We were, we were misnagam, you know, we went to synagogue and but we were I see I'm a, I'm a great lover of cities. So to me, uh, this is still a blessing. The fact that it's so much action on the street. Yeah, it's very lively. Do you remember Plum? Yeah. Plum. Yeah. Huh? Very much Plum. Do you remember it? Oh yeah. We would always end up in Plum. Oh really? After school? Yeah, and I think that um, one of the farmers went to high school with me. And they would like, that's where, the, that's where you got a real strong sense of social class because those kind of kids were very snooty. What can I say? They had more money? Because yeah, they, they had were more part money. of the farm's empire? Yeah. But they went to Eastern District? Yeah. There really wasn't much of a choice in my field. If you wanted your kids to enter American society, you couldn't you keep them to. in yeshiva, you know, yeah. It was either yeshiva or you go to Eastern District. Right. Here's Flums. Flums appetizers. Hi. Okay, let's push it out. It was bigger, I think. It was bigger? lived in Williamsburg also before we met. Oh, yeah? And she was an artist. And uh, she said that the city guys would be chasing her down the street, you know, trying to date her and oh, yeah. match make and everything. Like that. She lived where in Williamsburg did she live? She lived uh, on uh, well, on Broadway facing the uh, South Fifth Street, whatever it is, facing the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the highway, you know? Gotcha, uh, gotcha. Right across the street, directly from, uh, you know, 
Why am I blocking the name of the famous thing? Oh, yeah, Peter Luger. Peter Luger. Yeah. Peter Luger. So she lived on this side. On the I see. Yeah, it's street. right on the border. Big cross and then... And she said it was some really, really rough when she moved in. The neighborhood. Yeah, really rough. She said every time they would try to clean up the Lower East Side of drug dealers, you know, they would move over to Williamsburg. It's, it's a bit of like a new drug. They would strip cars, all that kind of thing. Yeah, that was the, like, 60s to 80s. Yeah, like we moved out uh, really in the late 80s. 1990 we got married, so I rescued her from Williamsburg. Oh, really? She was this the damsel in distress. This was before Williamsburg became so hot. So you got you married in 1990? Yeah. How did you meet? That's for mutual friend. Um, I had been teaching down in Houston, Texas. Um, and I told this friend that I was having really fed up with dating. I said, when I, when I went out with them, the boss women, they were better. And when I went out with the women who never got married, they were better. So what I really needed was a widow who could still maybe have good feelings about men, you know. So it turned out that Cheryl was a young widow that I was going to die. So, so my friend said, I know a widow, you know. This block was, as you can see, much, much more genteel than, than yeah. facing the elevated train, you know. Yeah. It's a very, very valuable neighborhood now. You can see more. Do you remember playing out here? You were, you were older. Yeah, I was, you know, come back here and play a little bit, but I just remember when we were, it's like my family was very, uh, I don't know if standoffish is the right word, but isolated. We were like, yeah. you know, they both were bohemians, and uh, so we just um, covered the wagons, you know, we just yeah. isolated ourselves. Yeah, I got that sense from reading about. Yeah. Friends can come over. It's this. This is no, that one's with the street. This one. Yeah. Look, it's being completely redone. It's a three-story building, basically. Um. And uh, we didn't get get along that well with the landlady, but that seemed to be characteristic. <laughs> well, your parents were characters, so. They were characters. What happened with your dad in the end? Was he in a nurse in the better nursing home that's where? Yeah, don't stay at the nursing home, okay? Terrible. My mother divorced my father when he was about 78 years old or something. She always wanted it and she finally got it. Put him in a nursing home. Um and he was very he was very frail at the end, you know. And um I remember being called into the the nursing home. Up, it was up around um, uh, Fort Tryon Park, you know, Manhattan. Um, the other courses, and um, my father was in the meeting, also sitting there in a wheelchair. And um, and they said, "Your father, your father's depressed." He's like 84 then. And, uh, and they said, "Why are you depressed, Mister Lovell?" They said. I want to get out of here. Why shouldn't you be depressed? I mean, you know, yeah. stuck on the, I want to get out of here. You know, one of the things that happened was that my my family had clawed their way into the middle class, sort of. And then once he once he was evicted from the middle class, it's like suddenly you have a roommate and you have, you know what I mean? You're, yeah. You, you dropped several social classes on the run, you know? So. So he finally, so he died. Um, he was very unhappy there, huh? Very unhappy, and he was, he was really... Did you try to get him out or no? That wasn't enough. Well, he, it was the second one. Or maybe even the third one. Um, but uh, first there was one all the way in Bayside. Then there was one in the middle of Manhattan, which he really liked because he could walk to buy a newspaper or to, to buy something, you know. Um, but as soon as he became 
incontinent, um, they, they, they kicked him out. Absolutely. So, um, so sad. So sad. So then he, he didn't like, he wasn't happy about being, like he didn't, it wasn't on his own behavior. That he, the thing is he'd been depressed all his life. It wasn't, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. It wasn't his own life. You know, suddenly this lively, violent guy hit him. Yeah, he that was. Yeah. He was a worker, you know, somebody who never took a sick day in his life to go to work, support this family of six. But at home he wouldn't work. Well, he was, he had a different attitude. Was his, his attitude towards domestic work? Oh my God. You should have heard my mother on that thing. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't lift a finger. <laughs> How about it with your family, with your parents? Well, I, my parents are very traditional that way, you know. I don't think my, I ever saw my father lifting a finger now. Change a light bulb on you. Yeah, maybe. Probably not. Build the silk. That's something. That's, yeah. This is a nice neighborhood for circus. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's... I'm sure it wasn't that way for you. What? The circus. Well, they were there. They were around. Circus were around. Some. I mean, it was just this kind of... Um, much more of a balanced mixture, it wasn't one, one group dominating it. But every time my family moved out, people like my family, I got to see them with more Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to me that there were communist Jews, that this was even a thing. Oh my God. Didn't you know that? That, that, um, that, um, you know, Hitler and the fascists always said that, that communism was a Jewish conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they were coming as Jews. And there was a, um, the, the workman's circle in Manhattan, you know, you know there was a lot of, um, of um, these educational alliance things where there was a lot yeah. of Marxism. So. Yeah, yeah. I would have thought that was in the early... That was in the 30s the, more. Yeah, yeah. It was in the 30s more, but there was, there was still some of it in the 40s. And then, of course, McCarthyism came in. And, and everything, yeah. Like, really shaking. So. You pushed it, yeah. So we hated McCarthy, we thought he was a clown, but we also thought he had his hand on the, on the levers and the power at that point. But you know, my, um, my father told my brother, you know, if, if, you're, if you're in uninsured, uninsured, unemployment insurance, and uh, they send you to this job you don't want, um, just come in with the daily worker under your elbow, and that's what you <laughs> Um, they'll kick you out real fast. Yeah, they'll kick you out real fast. My mother's complaint about the communists was that she thought they were bad conversationalists because they were always trying to raise her consciousness. And I see. They didn't know how to keep a real back and forth they, they always had an agenda. Yeah, my, my mother was a great talker. She didn't like the idea of people always trying to raise her consciousness. Yeah. Uh, she was a talker or a conversationalist? She was a conversationalist. She was a, she was a very witty. Very bitter, but very witty woman. Yeah, sarcastic, but a good talker, a good conversationalist. She didn't like people who come at the conversation with an agenda. It ruins yeah, it. She didn't yeah, like it does ruin it. Of course. Yeah. Of course, I've known all my life. I've been basically on the left, and I've known um, radicals who are total pains in the ass. You know, and you know, always trying to force an agenda. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The same with religious people who, who proselytize. Yeah, exactly. It's a, actually to some degree it's similar with filming, which is you have an agenda and it hovers over a conversation, you know? Like I would enjoy talking to you more if we wouldn't have a camera, sorry. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's you my know, doing, yeah. You know, the great documentarian Fred Weissman claims that people don't notice it after. Oh, really? But he spends he spends months and months and months with people and after a while they just carry, carry on their life. Not uh, noticing. The, yeah, he has... It's a camera and a sound person. That's it, just like you do. Yeah, yeah. That's the the trick is to keep it small. But even then, I don't know. I think we've it's so ubiquitous now. People do it to themselves all the time, and I guess they do get used to it. But there's a subconscious, I think, element of self censorship. Of, of course. It does. It. It. I don't know. I try to not, not selfie my life at all for this reason. I cannot take pictures of of important moments for 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 the world because the moment you do it you're starting to orchestrate it for and you're branding yourself you know exactly. my poor daughter she's 27 years old she's grown up in this selfie culture 
And she is an old soul, but she still feels sometimes like she needs to upgrade her, you know, Instagram or whatever, you know. I'm so glad I didn't have to any of that. It's terrible. It's terrible. I actually don't do my own social media. I have someone do it for because I find it to be so soul sucking. You start to oh, definitely. measure yourself by reactions and Oh my no. What about your son? Does he get into it? He we I, I actually don't want him to have a, a smartphone. I know it's very unusual, but he has a flip phone. He's he's on Discord on the computer. And that's fine by me and he's you know, he hangs out with friends on the on on chats online, but I don't like this being up until two in the morning scrolling culture. Oh my God, and then most of it is just this, this chat. How are you? What's up? You know, yeah, 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 yeah. I That's, just, I was, walk? yeah, I was just in, um, in Ireland last week. I was in Dublin. Oh, really? Dublin giving a talk, yeah. Did you have a nice time? Lovely time. I really like Dublin. It's a great Dublin. country. And, 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 and for the first time in any gig, they sent an, uh, an airline ticket to me and my wife. Ooh. I'd never seen that before, you know, that they paid for the spouse. But anyway, so we had a good time. Um, so she came? Yeah. Probably. What did she do? Did she, did she... she was a painter and a graphic designer, and now she's pretty much retired. Gotcha. But um, the guy who, was, who had brought me over, a professor of English, um, lovely guy, said that his son um, was about 13, had gotten a smartphone, but then they found out that he was chatting with a 14-year-old girl, and they said, no, no, we, it's not going to happen. It's interesting. I give tours. Something that happens on the tours is we talk about the culture here where kids don't have smartphones, right? Right. And hmm. it's very interesting how many parents respond to, I wish I could, Yes. that could be the case with my kids. Oh, my God. You know, when I published a book and the publisher said, well, what, what's your, uh, you know, what's your Facebook, what's your Twitter, what's your, I said, I don't do any of that, you know, you're going to have to do it. I'm not going to do any of it. Did they do it? Mm, not as much bit. as I would have liked, but, yeah. you know, I, I know writers who spend a lot of time promoting themselves. To me, you can either do the work or you can promote yourself. You can't do both, you know. That's what I think. That's that's what I think. I think, I don't I don't know. I feel like it, to be a successful writer at this point, most people are just successful PR agents for themselves. Yeah, right. Well, I'm not doing that. Yeah, I you know there's a whole genre of exocetic writing now. Uh huh. And it's mostly exocetic branding, self branding. Right. There's not a lot of good writing coming out of this experience, like the whole Jewish writing culture. But what about filmmaking? I mean. Are you going to make films also? I'm hoping to do more um, exploring inside, putting together pieces of stories. Like I, uh, something I really am interested is in, in documenting the 1950s. Yeah. Uh, Williamsburg, which is such a transformative time. It's interesting to me that you almost don't remember it as transformative. It just was. That's my impression. Yeah, well, because when you're a kid, you know, you don't realize you know, like you're living in an interesting neighborhood, that's all there is, you know? Exactly. The only experience we had of other neighborhoods was basically once in a blue moon we would go to a relative's house and our relatives looked down on us because we were poor. And they and we looked down on them because they thought they were uncultured boots. From the boring lives in the suburbs. It's true though. So it is boring lives in the suburbs. That, that you thought was so transformative about the 50s. Yeah. Well, it was really the time that this neighborhood became a city, essentially. I think. And it, it's, it was a very interesting, I think it's a very interesting story in, 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 in Jewish, the general story of Jewish making it is you, but really, on the, without the story being recognized for what it was, it was a very different success story. Of, Holocaust survivors essentially taking over. Yeah, there was a um, there was a documentary that I saw. It was pretty good about these these Hasidic women who started an ambulance service. Yeah, I think it's uh, called Queen. Yes. Nine one one Queen. Yeah, I liked it. Yeah, you liked it. I didn't watch it. That's good. It, it's I, I know Rookie Fryer, so I know. That's good. It, like. You know, especially for women who are about to 
give birth and didn't want to be yeah in a, an ambulance with, with guys you know it makes sense perfect yeah but it's so much men's turf mentor men the men's turf like yeah it's a trust it's men's turf but it's crazy because there she was doing something that in a way was respectful of her yeah and, and it's, you get so much grief from the men i know it's incredible you know when i think about it i i it's shocking to me that it shouldn't be encouraged and then but on its face without thinking about it my my sympathies are automatically with men like this is male term really 911 is men yeah because it's like from male men with too much energy we're dealing with the domestic life they need, they need to get out yeah and they 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 have keys they have a walkie-talkie they do the 911 yeah but what about women who have energy to, to yeah well exactly what about women who don't want to be at home? That's the whole point of feminism. Women want to get out to the world. No. Well, the thing is, this community makes, especially Williamsburg, makes no efforts to even try to espouse any kind of feminism. Right. You know, not even to to to, to do any kind of neo-feminism. Oh, our women are more empowered by being mo modest. Nothing. It's very simple. We are not feminists. What are you taking away from this visit? Anything? Getting to know you. Oh, it's my pleasure to get to know you. Um, you know, I know, I know what, what I have to say all too well. I'm much more interested in what you have to say. How much what? Huh? What do you mean? Well, I mean, what you, when you were telling me about little things about your life, it was interesting to me. Look, my life is not, is not as interesting to me. I know it all too well. Oh, I see what you mean. But the other thing that I really like was seeing the street tickets. Yes. Oh, that's what I want to hear. Yeah, no, I, I you know, um, I love the amount of, of life in the streets. Um, Do you remember it like that? Yeah. Especially Lee Avenue. Um, I mean, Broadway was much more um, hopping and much more Broadway seems kind of sad to me. Yeah, Broadway is terrible. Broadway is a place to just get. Nobody really wants to, um, you know, rent a shop underneath, you know, the dark. Yeah, great. Uh, so Broadway has been a sad, very dilapidated place for but a But in time. general, and not just in Williamsburg, but on any of the stops in the elevated, um, those were popular places because people would get off the train and then they'd buy something and then they'd go home. So traditionally... Yeah, we're going with it. It was, um, it was uh, commercially lively, those streets. But that's all changed, you know what I'm saying? It's interesting the way Main, Main Avenue's moved. Yeah, we're going... Gottlieb. Gottlieb, have you been here? No. <laughs>